turn to Romans chapter 14, and I want to look at verse 19. And we're going to jump right into this. I have a lot that I want to share and a lot that I want to say. Now, last week, we ministered a message that was titled, uh, Giving the Gift of You. Who was here last week to hear that, that message, Giving the Gift of You? Let's, let's go and let's, let's just go through that real quick. I've, I've got that. I went ahead and put that in the lineup. I want to review last week. And, uh, and, it, and it should be on there, right there in order. Lesson one, we talked about how to be a blessing to others. And we laid the groundwork in that. Lesson two, we talked about giving ourselves away. And then in lesson three, we talked about having to have a ready and a willing heart. Well, today I want to take it to the next level. Last week we laid the groundwork, talked about gifts and 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 i really felt like that this christmas season let's give a gift that's probably more valuable than anything we give ourselves away amen so last week we talked about that this week and let's go ahead and put this graphic up here i want to talk about the gift of encouragement can can anybody in here agree with me that encouragement is something that we need a little bit more of in today's day and age the gift of encouragement I don't know about you, but there's times that I've been discouraged and I've just needed somebody with a word of encouragement or a hug or, you know, just a word of affirmation. Did you know that around the Christmas season that a lot of people struggle with discouragement? Matter of fact, it's during this time of the year that some people get depressed and they get very discouraged. And we don't want that to happen. Amen? We don't want that to happen. So let's look at Romans chapter 14, verse 19, and let's read this. Together Now, the King James Version says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith we may edify one another or edify one another. The Amplified Bible words it this way. Let us definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and for mutual upbuilding. Say that with me. Mutual upbuilding up building let's say that again mutual up building you got to say it again some of you aren't getting this mutual up building let us do these things for mutual up building that means edification and development for one another so today i want to talk about giving the gift of encouragement let's pray father we thank you so much for all that you've done lord i thank you for the worship i thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that was here during our worship. Thank you, Lord, for the workers. And Lord, thank you for the girls that ministered to us in song. Thank you for all of that, leading us up to this point to receive from your word. And Father, anoint our ears to hear, anoint our hearts to receive. And I pray that all of us are going to be stirred. Lord, I pray that all of us are going to be encouraged today about this message. Because, Lord, all of us as believers, we have got to learn how to encourage one another at a whole different level. Open our eyes that we will see. Open our ears that we may hear. And, Lord, open our hearts that we will be sensitive to you about the areas that we need to work on concerning encouragement. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving the gift of encouragement. Encouragement doesn't cost any money. It might cost a little time. It'll cost a little bit of yourself, and it'll cost a little bit of your heart, but it's not going to cost you any money. Now, you might choose to uh, connect a gift to giving encouragement to somebody. You might want to give a card. You might want to give a gift, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Who would agree with me today that sometimes just maybe a text or a phone call or a hug as you walked into church was something that you just needed? Amen. It was just a word spoken at the right time. Let me see the hands of those. Somebody spoke a word to you at the right time, and it made your day. It made your week. Well, the Bible tells us that we're called to do this. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to be encouraging and edifying and pouring into the lives of other people. And the reason why is because discouragement has become a disease in our nation. Encouragement is important for one because God commands it. But secondly, discouragement faces a lot of us that are here today. Yes, discouragement. Anybody in here ever get discouraged? 
You can lift up your hand because you're in good company. David got discouraged. Elijah got discouraged. Abraham got discouraged. The Apostle Paul got discouraged. All through Scripture we see were many patriarchs of the faith. They got discouraged. It's not a sin to get discouraged, amen? It's not a sin. It happens to the best of us, and it happens to prayer warriors. It happens to people that have been serving the Lord for years. All of us at one time or another have went through a season of discouragement. Now, the word discouragement defined is a loss of confidence or enthusiasm. Anybody in here ever lose confidence or enthusiasm? I've lost my enthusiasm a few times. That's discouragement. It also means dispiritedness. Synonyms of discouragement is hopelessness, depression, despair. Listen, it's, it's okay if you've struggled with these things because it happens. Especially around the Christmas season, you see where depression happens to a lot of people. Dismay, disappointment. Anybody in here ever been disappointed? Come on. Another synonym is sadness, and another one is downheartedness. See, discouragement is nothing new. It's all through Scripture. In John chapter 20, verses 11 through 13, the Bible tells us of the next, of the, on the third day when Jesus rose, Mary Magdalene was at Jesus' grave, and she was discouraged. Why? Because she put her trust in Jesus, and she went to the tomb, and the Bible says Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb in verse 11 of John 20. And she wept, and she stooped to look at the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there. In the body of Jesus, where it was, it wasn't there, and, and, and one at the head and one at the feet, and they said, woman, why are you weeping? She said, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Wailing in front of Jesus' empty tomb was Mary Magdalene, and it isn't difficult to imagine how important Jesus had become to her because Jesus delivered her from demonic possession. Amen. Jesus delivered her from a life of sin. And so she's discouraged because she doesn't know where the body of Jesus is. The good thing is that the tomb was empty and Jesus had rose again. The message of that example is the fact that she knew where to go when she got discouraged. She went to where she thought Jesus might be. And the good news is this. I want you to hear this. This is what's awesome. Jesus had a long list of things he needed to do after he was resurrected. There was a lot Jesus had to accomplish over the next few days. But he stuck around the tomb to minister to Mary Magdalene. He waited around. He knew she would be there. And he was there to offer her words of comfort for her discouragement. Are y'all with, with me today? And so what that tells me is that not only Jesus is there to help us in our times of discouragement, but the Bible tells us that we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. The Bible tells us that we carry Jesus' presence with us everywhere we go. And so because Jesus wants to meet the needs of discouraged people, he expects us to meet the needs of discouraged people as his people. Amen? Let me give you a great example of this in action, and I put it in my devotional today in the bulletin. In the 2016 Rio Olympics, there were two athletes that were racing in the 5,000-meter race. About 3,200 meters into the race, New Zealander Nikki Hamblin and American Abby Diagnostino collided and fell. How many ever saw this footage? How many ever remember this story from last year? Now, I'm not going to have them put up the footage today. I, ha I had a YouTube video ready, but that's okay. But, but you can look in your bulletin, their names. I want you to go on YouTube, and I want you to look at the, the video of what happened. This is what happened while they were competing in the Olympics. Moments after these two athletes had started running again, Abby began faltering and her right leg injured as a result of the fall. It was now Nikki's turn to stop and encourage her fellow athlete to finish the race. When Abby eventually stumbled across the finish line, Nikki was waiting to embrace her. What a beautiful picture of encouragement. Two people from two separate countries competing against one another. They collide they both fall, but the other one stands there and says, you can do it, I'll wait for you. And waits for them at the finish line and waits for them. And you can see it, it's on YouTube. If you, if you Google this, you've got their names in the bulletin, you can see the embrace that they give one another, that they were encouraging one another. See, church family, this is the lesson that, that tells us. In the race of life, we sometimes witness others falling and stumbling. It might have happened as a result of something we did. It might not have resulted in anything that had us, with us to do with it. But the, but the lesson is this. We see people fall and stumble all the time, all the time. 
If you can open your eyes and open your ears enough to let the Lord reveal to you those that are stumbling in this race of life, there's a lot of people that are stumbling. We've got marriages that are stumbling and parents that are stumbling and workers that are stumbling. It's not a sin to stumble, but you've just gotten discouraged and along the way you have fallen. Now, I'm not saying you're giving in to sin or you're backslidden, but you know what I'm talking about. We got some bruised knees and, and, and we scuffed ourselves on the forehead, but this is what we need. We need others who are running that race beside us to, to stop and say, you know what? It isn't about me continuing to leave them behind. I'm going to give them a word of encouragement because even though they might be hurt, that might be all they need. That might be all they need is simply a word of encouragement. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 10 says two are better than one if either of them falls down one can help the other up but pity anyone who falls and has no one there to help him up did you see that how many's ever been in a situation to where you were the one that fell and nobody was there to pick you up it's okay not a good feeling is it so how much more should we want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I know what it feels like. Therefore, I want to be the person that's there to lift others up. You know, that can be a calling. That can be a calling. An exhorter. An exhorter is a gift. That, that is a gift. Did you guys cover that in discipleship? Gloria covered this in discipleship, that exhortation is a spiritual gift. Some of you in here today are called to just be an exhorter. You might not be able to sing or teach or, or preach or, you know, do, do anything with your hands. But, man, you sure can be an exhorter. You sure can encourage. Amen. But, but, Pastor, will that make somebody think that I'm endorsing uh, their lifestyle? Maybe they, maybe they fell as a result of their own sin. Maybe they sowed some bad seeds, and, and, and maybe they're reaping from some of those seeds that they sowed. Did you know that encouragement is more than just speaking a word that, that might sound positive? Sometimes positive words are pointing someone in the right direction. I encourage you to seek the Lord. I encourage you to repent of that sin. I encourage, you, you see how much better that sounds? When you see somebody that's caught in a situation or maybe they're stumbling because they sin and instead of pointing your finger and looking at them and saying, you hard, dark sinner, you, I can't believe that you did that. Doesn't it sound a lot better to say, I encourage you to get on your knees before the Lord. I encourage you to repent. I encourage you to draw near to God. Isn't that a whole lot better to approach that subject? Amen? We can even minister a tough message and speak truth, but do it in love and do it in an encouraging way. Right. See, the Bible says in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love who? One another. James 5, 16, pray for one another that you may be healed. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 23 through 25, we are members of one another. Another, are you getting the theme of this? God has tempered the body of Christ together that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for what? One another. Are you getting the theme here? Then we go back to our opening text in Romans chapter 14, verse 19, and the wording that that used was what? One another. Now, Romans says to edify one another. When you look up the word edify, it means to build like a structure or an architecture. Are you getting this, church family? It doesn't matter how you slice it, and you can deny it, and you can choose not to believe it, but this is the issue. As the body of Christ, we are one body together. Amen. You can isolate yourself. You can choose to disassociate. You can choose to not fellowship. You can choose to not have anything else to do with those that are in the body of Christ or the church here that you're a part of. But the Bible says spiritually... We are all connected. We are all members one of another. So wouldn't, you, wouldn't it stand to reason that the Bible continues to say, do this one for another, pray for one another, build up one another, edify one another, that we ought to be looking for opportunities to be able to do this to another individual? Let me ask you this challenging question today, okay? Have any of you done anything for somebody this last week that, that didn't involve you or your immediate family? 
How about this? Did you do anything for somebody that could not help themselves? That didn't have a means to take care of a certain need or issue within their life? Did you make yourself available to say, maybe I'm the one that God is providing to meet the need of this individual's life? Are y'all with me today? So let's get into lesson one. Actually, let's get into this. Let's, let's give some foundational lessons. And as I talk about these truths, let me just say this, okay? Hold on. Let me, I say this in an encouraging and loving way. If you're not making an effort to encourage others, you are in disobedience to the Lord. If you're not making an effort to encourage other people, you are in disobedience to the Lord. You, you, mean, you mean that's a sin? That is a sin. Disobedience is sin. You mean like cussing and, and all those real bad sins and drinking and, and watching things I shouldn't be watching on the Internet or on TV or not being able to forgive somebody? You... you you mean simply by, let me, let me tell you something. One of the things that you learn in Scripture is you get sins of commission. That means you actually committed it. But then you've got sins of omission. That means you failed to do something that was required of you by God. Are y'all getting this? The sins of commission are easy to label because we look at our lifestyle and we look at what we have refused to do. Well, I didn't commit that sin. I didn't commit that. I didn't lie, so I didn't commit it. I didn't steal, so I didn't commit it. But what about the sins of omission, the things that God says you need to do this and then we don't do? Are y'all getting this today? So if we are not encouraging other people, we are walking in disobedience to the Lord. And let, let me say this too as we deal with these foundational truths. Sometimes the answer to your prayers is simply you getting out of your comfort zone and giving to someone what you need yourself. What am I... How do you expect me, pastor, to bring encouragement to somebody's life when I'm the one that needs encouragement? Give, and it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Sometimes you give out of your need. You bless out of your need. You sow out of your need. You do these things. Sometimes the answer is simply us doing what we feel like others ought to be doing for us. And then when we start doing it, watch the law of reciprocity turn around and, and it'll come right back to you. I guarantee you start encouraging other people and God will start bringing encouragers your life. Everywhere you look around, God's going to start bringing encouragers to you. Amen. And these are some foundational truths that we got to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 3 through 4 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Notice that we may be able to comfort others who are also in trouble. Whatever God has given to you freely, God expects you to freely give it back to others in return. Some of you, the reason why God even ministers to you in your situation is so you will take the gift of that ministry and turn around and bring that gift to somebody else. Do you realize that sometimes your trials and your testimonies were never even meant for you? This is a deep lesson for me. And the longer I serve the Lord and the longer I, I go through life, the more I'm realizing maybe that trial wasn't for me. Maybe that fiery furnace wasn't for me. Maybe all the Lord was doing was polishing my testimony so when the right opportunity presents itself, I could take what God did for me and bring blessing to someone else. Let's put that scripture back up there. Let's look at this. Read this. Again. Get this down in your spirit as we deal with this foundational truth. 2 Corinthians. Let's look at this. Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. God comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted by God with. Are you, are you getting this today? Are some of you getting this? Now, we can bury this or we can walk out of church today and say, you know, la, la, la. You know, <laughs> we did the la, la, I didn't hear this. But see, church family, I think that this message is a word for today. 
I really do. Because this is what I'm seeing. We're seeing this trend, and we talked about this, um, I don't know, a few days ago, last weekend. This time of the year, my days get all mixed up. I, it was last weekend, going through this leadership training. Um, our speaker was talking about the challenges that we face in ministry today because people want to separate themselves more and more from fellowship. And so what's happening is, is we're actually isolating ourselves from the way God designed for us to receive ministry. See, the Lord understood that in order for ministry to be fulfilled the way he designed it, we got to come together. That we are a body fitly joined together, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says. And we got to be able to come together and edify one another and build up one another and pray for one another and be there for one another because you can't separate the body. But what's happening is today, because people are discouraged or they're depressed or they don't want to be bothered, they, 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 they disassociate themselves from the very source of strength God placed them in in a church home. Listen, I, I love Internet, and, and I love the fact that, that we uh, are posting videos on our YouTube station. And thank you, Bill. Bill, can you say how much you appreciate Bill for doing those videos? Every week, Bill does those YouTube videos. <laughs> Brian Cottom last month was in Florida, and he texted me on a Monday, and he said, man, it was awesome. I wasn't in church today, and, but, man, I was able to see that video just a day after. I wasn't there to hear it, but I got to hear it on YouTube. And, and some of you wonder what this little thing is. This, this is a live stream. We're doing a live stream now. We're doing a live stream now. We've been doing test runs, but today it's on the church Facebook page. Am I right, Bill? And so we're getting the word out for shut-ins or people traveling or people sick. Now, now if that starts replacing church, we ain't going to stream anymore. <laughs> but that's there. But you know what's happening is there's thousands of people around the world that are going to use this as their sole means of church. They don't want to fellowship. They don't want to have to be around anybody. Why? Because they don't have to mess with people. Can we be honest here? Can we just, can we just be honest? Some of us are hard people to get along with. I, come on, let's make this real. Some of us are just hard people to, to, to pray for and to love and to forgive. Some of us wrong each, rub each other the wrong way. Come on. So, some of us are like hugging a porcupine. Amen. Just, just, just. I'm serious. And we get hurt. We get hurt by church people. We get discouraged. I, I hope nobody, I hope if we forgot to give you a gift today, don't leave here all discouraged and, and depressed. But I'm, but I'm, these things happen. I didn't get my name in the bulletin or I didn't get recognized or, or this happened or that happened or somebody didn't shake my hand. Or, or that. Listen, don't let the enemy take those things in your life and get you to not fellowship with the body of Christ Amen. and choose not to be in church over those things. We need one another. Let's say this. We need one another. Let's say it again. We need one another. I need you. Mark, I need you. Toby, I need you. Zach, I need you. Timmy, I definitely need you when you're moving things. Amen. Aaron, I need you. I need all of you. Slim, I need you. Dave, I need you. Danny, I need you. Jim, I need you. I mean, I'm looking across the sanctuary, and I'm telling you, church family, I might be the one that's online right now preaching. I might be the face of the church because I'm the bishop. Big deal. There's no way that the ministry of this church would ever get accomplished if we didn't have volunteers who were willing to sacrifice of their time and their talent and their treasure and be willing to be an encouragement as they do it. I thank God for the volunteers that we have in this church. I thank God that we don't have a bunch of drama going on. I thank God that we got encouragers who are in leadership and encouragers who are doing ministry. I thank God for that. Because when people from the outset come in and they witness the, 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 the Terre Haute Church of God in action, they want to see Christ. They don't want to see disunity. They don't want to see drama. They don't want to see issues. They want to see Jesus. Hallelujah. And the way we bring Jesus to a world that needs to see Jesus is we, be we become a representative of Jesus, an ambassador for the kingdom, the scripture says we are. Amen. And we do that through encouragement. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, encouragement, if you look up the word in the Greek, it means to edify, to comfort, to console, to inquire. That's a good one. To inquire. Now that's not a nosy inquiry. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people are just nosy. So where were you and who were you with and what time were you there? 
Some people are just nosy. This is an inquire of genuine concern. You know, some people want to exploit somebody's weaknesses and they operate in the wrong spirit that isn't the spirit of Christ, and I get it. I've been the subject of it. But I'm talking about inquiring of someone and saying, Brother, I sense when you came into church today that your spirit was a little low. I sense that you really had a hard time getting into the worship. Is there anything I can do? I make myself available. Is there anything I can do? Just let me know. Are you getting this? Now, I understand with everybody's busy schedules, sometimes it's hard to drop everything. I get that. But you still got to make yourself available, and you need to do it to be an encourager to somebody, and that's what that means. Now, to encourage also means to plead and to counsel and to challenge. For example, as a pastor, I'm called to teach and preach truth. What you do with that truth is up to you. But in so doing, I got to make sure, even if it's a challenge, I'm pointing you to Jesus, and I do it in love. Amen. Amen. So you can be an encourager and still challenge people at the same time. You just need to make sure that you're doing it in the right spirit. Amen. Amen. Because the reason why is because, let's all be honest, we're all dealing in a day and age where we got too much negativity, we got too much pessimism, and we've got too many people that, that got deconstructive attitudes. Now, in trying to encourage and challenge somebody, don't use them as the subject of a Facebook post. Or don't gossip about them to someone else talking about something that's nobody else's business. Amen? Amen. Amen. You keep it between you and them. If you want to challenge somebody, keep it private. If you need to encourage, keep it private. Because even Jesus said, make sure your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. He said, if you only do what you're doing to be seen of man, you've received your reward. The praise you got from other people, you got your reward. You're not going to get it in heaven. So these are some foundational truths that all of us have to understand. The Bible says that we got to love one another. We got to support one another. We got to comfort one another. We got to edify one another. And we've got to encourage one another. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 1 3, blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us, who brings encouragement. 2 Thessalonians 2 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, In God, even the Father, who's loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. What's consolation mean? Encouragement. John 14, 26, Jesus says, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the word comforter means encourager. He says, the encourager, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father's going to send in my name, he'll teach you and he'll bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever things I have said. So it's obviously in Scripture. It's obvious in Scripture that we need to be completing the will of God in our life by being an encouragement to other people. Number two, let's look at a biblical example. Let's look at Barnabas. How many of you have ever heard of a man named Barnabas? Now, I'm going to be quick with this because I know um, we, we got time issues. I got, I got more information here than I do time to get this message across. But I challenge you in your own time, I want you to look up Barnabas. And look at his life. Because when you look up the name Barnabas, it means son of consolation, which means son of encouragement. That was the name given to him by the Lord. When you look at the examples that he has all through Scripture, let's go to lesson three. Actually, let's just go to lesson three because we're going to talk about biblical characteristics of an encourager. And let's go to the next page. There's three things I want to bring out in this. Let's put this up. I want you to write these things down. These are biblical characteristics of an encourager, and I've got them all right here. An encourager reaches out. An encourager understands that this is truly God's work, and an encourager makes this a lifestyle. Did you get that? So let's back this out. What does that mean, an encourager reaches out? Let's use Barnabas as our example, and let's look at the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, Barnabas reached out to a new convert, not just any new convert. And when Saul came to Jerusalem, who's Saul? The Apostle Paul. Aren't you glad that, the, that Barnabas was there to encourage the Apostle Paul when he first got saved? Are y'all getting this? Aren't you glad somebody was there when Billy Graham got saved? Aren't you glad somebody looked at him and encouraged him? I give God praise for the one person in my life in 1989 who encouraged me. I thank God for the man that looked past the hair, the earring, the ripped t-shirt, 
the skinny body because of drugs and alcohol. I thank God somebody looked past all of that and saw this skinny 19-year-old kid who gave his heart to Jesus and didn't grow up in church, didn't know anything about the kingdom, didn't know kingdom vernacular, didn't know church talk, didn't even know anything about church because I wasn't raised in church. I thank God for that man. He invested in my life. And I remember when he sat down with me and he shared with me about Jesus and about the return of the Lord. And I remember when he said, hey, you, you, I lived about 45 minutes north of Louisville where I grew up. And he said, hey, I got a group of people from the church that are going to go down and see this, this production about Jesus. It's in a church. Would you be willing to come? I'll drive you down. I'll pay, I'll pay for your supper. You can sit beside me. Thank God for that man. Because you know what? You as the congregation of the Terre Haute Church of God are benefiting from that man that he planted in my life. Amen. Amen. He reached out to me. Now you got to understand when Barnabas reached out to Paul, he was still Saul. This is the persecutor of the church. This is the man who had been killing believers and thinking he was doing God a favor. And he was able to look past what, what Saul had done, and he knew that God had instructed him to help him and to encourage him. And when Saul came to Jerusalem, he had said to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and didn't believe that he was a disciple. The only reason why he's doing this is because he wants to infiltrate the church. But Barnabas, but Barnabas took him. The son of consolation, the encourager. So notice, not only did he encourage the Apostle Paul, what did he do? Now he's encouraging the other disciples. He's challenging them. I implore you guys, listen, I declare to you, he saw the Lord in the way. He had spoken to him, and he preached boldly at Damascus the name of Jesus. I've seen this man's life. He's a true convert. So let's go back to this. What happens? An encourager reaches out. Secondly, an encourager understands that this is God's work. What does that mean? You've got to look past a person's personality. You've got to look past a person's past. You've you got to look past the baggage that comes along the way. Well, what happens if I encourage somebody and they're going to take it the wrong way and they're, they're going to think that I'm endorsing their sin? Leave it up to God. You just understand this is God's work. If God directs you to encourage somebody, you do it. But what are people going to say? What are people going to say? This person's got a reputation in the city. It doesn't matter what people say. This is God's work. You reach out to them and encourage them. You might be the man like the man that invested in me. But pastor, I've been burned before. I've reached out to other people, and people have taken advantage of me. That doesn't remove your treasure from heaven. Are you getting this? Somebody might have taken advantage of you, and somebody might have even hurt you, but they couldn't take your treasure in heaven because as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Now, whether they receive it or whether they end up serving the Lord or whether they might serve the Lord and end up backside, that's, that's between them and the Lord. You did your part. Amen. You're a fisher of man. You reached out, you threw the hook out in the water, and you let him bite. You let Jesus be the one that cleans him up. Amen. Amen. See, in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, Barnabas was enhancing the work of God. The Bible tells us, look, let's look at this, Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. And Joseph, who by apostles named him Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He, under, he understood to the degree that where my treasure is, that's where my heart is. He understood this is God's work and I'm willing to actually, this season isn't even required of me. This isn't required. This isn't a tie that's, that's a commanded by God. I'm just going to do this. I'm gonna, I got some land. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to give it because this is God's work. I've given my heart to the Lord and everything I have is the Lord's. And if the Lord impresses me to do it, I'm not telling go home and sell everything and bring it into the church. You've got to listen to the Lord when he says those things. Amen. This was his gift. He was, he was an exhorter. 
But he heard from the Lord and he was willing. And he had a ready and a willing heart. He understood that this was God's work. Can I get an amen, man? This is, this is good stuff. And then an encourager makes this a lifestyle. All through Scripture we see where this is a lifestyle in the, in the life of, of Barnabas. In Acts chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, it says that when he came and had seen the grace of God, was a glad person and exhorted them all because he desired that they would cleave to the Lord for he was a righteous man full of the Holy Ghost and faith and much people were added unto the Lord. Did you get that? Let's go back and look at that again. I want to read this. Look, go back to verse 23. Let's read these two, two verses again. Can this define you? I've seen the grace of God. Who in here has seen the grace of God? You see the hands of everybody that has seen the grace of God. Amen. Barnabas witnessed the grace of God and was glad. Some of you need an anointed smile at church. Some of you need a double portion of that anointing. Some of you need a hundredfold of that anointing. If the grace of God has come to you, you're going to be glad. And because I know the grace of God and because the joy of the Lord is my strength and I was glad about what God did for me, I'm going to exhort other people. Don't you love it when somebody first gets saved, you see them come into church and God cleans them up and, they come, and they've got this joy? Doesn't it convict you as a seasoned saint? That's what Jesus said. He said, go back and remember your first love and do your first works over again. Remember where you fell, man. Go back and do those first works. Get that joy again. Understand the grace of God. Understand, understand that you come to church not to show your religious mass to everybody, but to be an example to everybody so you can exhort them. Let's look at this verse again, Ashley. Uh, I'm, I'm close. I, I, I truly am. I, he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. Are, are you getting this? this? This is convicting me. Verse 24, for he was a good man. Now, I don't know about you. There is nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I want that to be my testimony. Amen. I want people to look at me and say, they're a good woman. They're a good man. Yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. When people hear my name, I don't want them to run the other way. Yeah. I'm serious. When people think, take this with you. When people think of your name, what do you think they think? The book of Proverbs is very clear about the fact that all of us should want to seek a good name. But I don't do my works before man. Listen, don't, listen, that's a whole different lesson there. What kind of legacy are you leaving in this life? Because I'll tell you what, the older I get as a pastor, the more I look at my life and I wonder, what kind of legacy am I leaving? Can I have the report that I'm a good man and I'm full of the Holy Ghost and I'm full of faith? Can people look at me and say he's an encourager because he's full of the Holy Ghost? What comes out of him is the Holy Ghost. The words that come out of him are Holy Ghost inspired words and he's full of faith. When I come to him with a bad report, he's not a Debbie Downer or what, what words do we want to use? He, 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 the way he's a person that's full of faith. He's a person that comes in and says, it's going to be okay. He's a person that when he sees me fall on the track, like the example we gave at the beginning of the message, he might not have anything to give, but at least he can give a word and say, come on, let's, let's, let's finish this race together. And what's the result of this? What's the end of verse 24? What's it say? And much people was added unto the Lord. Wow. And let's close this with lesson four. Encouragement never fails. Far more negative words of criticism and blame and ridicule and gossip and backbiting hits us every day. Much more than positive and, and words of recognition and words of praise and words of thankfulness. And the reason why this is is because so few people today are doing it. It's very difficult to share what others, with others what you do not feel yourself. The prerequisite for encouraging others 
is to be encouraged yourself. Encouragement sometimes is just a word of hope. It's just an assurance. It's, It's just a prayer or a smile or a pat on the back. With the right godly encouragement, we can survive what the devil is bringing, not only in our life, but in the life of somebody else. We can help somebody endure the trial that they're going through, and we can help them see victory over their circumstances. Because it's our job to let people know that God still loves them, and God is merciful, and God is forgiving. Encouragement flows from what we believe. It is an expression of our own personal faith in God. But discouraging words also are an expression of what we believe. Because over and over and over again in the scriptures, the Bible tells us that death and life is in the power of the tongue. I want to be an encourager. And I hope you do too. Stand with me. Thank you.